people um, just dive into productive technologies, and uh, it doesn't really matter how how hard, um, how complicated those technologies are, they, they still are able to, to understand, to learn it, and to make something out of it. So um, it's good to have someone here. We have our parents here, so thank you for trusting us um, this time as well. I know there are some parents who have sent their kids a couple of times already, and maybe um, some of you have been to our hackathons, and I really hope that uh, you will continue coming to our hackathons and learn, um, and we will challenge you with some of the uh, most incredible problems that we're still facing in the society. We know that we have a hackathon happening in October, um, and we hope you will all come um, you know, with all the knowledge that you've learned. So welcome, um, everyone. So young people here, uh, they've had quite a journey. So they all um, applied, they've all been tested. Uh, there is a test that Peter writes every year, uh, which is uh, an incredible test you have for developers to take, but I will show you uh, later on. But everyone here is um, a very, very special child. They're all here on merit. Uh, they have taken the test, they have passed the test, they all came to see me for an interview. Um, they had a separate interview with Peter who asked them some other math questions and played cards with them, testing their intuition and something else. I don't know. I think when I asked him, what are you testing them for? So I just wanted to see how they learn. So, okay, great. So that was Peter. And, uh, and I know when they saw the test, everyone usually hates Peter, but by the time um, you know, the Andrew Beck accelerator is normally the favorite person. And at the moment he's not here, but I know he should be here with us any moment because I think he has some work to do. But um, a few years ago, I was told what I'm doing right now is impossible to scale. Um, and I remember I ran out of the room, I was out of the launchpad accelerator, Google launchpad. And I was told by all of my advisors and everyone, you know, and analysis is amazing what you're doing, but you will never be able to scale this because. You know, it's technology, it's AI as well, and it's teenagers, where we find, we find all these mentors and everything. But I'm so happy that um, literally just now we've had a uh, hackathon that just finished in, in Kenya, in Nairobi. And this is the very first um, hackathon in artificial intelligence for teenagers that took place alongside Deep Learning in Dubai, which is the largest machine learning conference um, in Africa. And I believe it just, just ended, so my team will be messaging me, uh, telling me who the winner was and what they were trying to solve. There were eight teams, um, so I will show you some of the, the slides because I've received some photos since then. Um, and that is what um, they have been doing, and it was really amazing. We literally took them through all of the processes that we have uh, taken you for the last 10 days, except it was a three-day hack. Um, so they learned about design thinking, uh, they learned about AI, machine learning technologies, some of the, the beginners learned how to do Python, uh, some of the more advanced, um, I think they played with uh, Microsoft ML technologies, but also uh, did some stuff on TensorFlow, but we had uh, university students who were mentors, um, we had a hiccup, I think for one day when um, Allowed in, and the kids were at risk of not being fed. <laughs> I told them that I wasn't too happy about it, and I think on day three they got it all sorted. But today there was a big pitch. Uh, DeepMind supported this. Uh, I believe it's a UN SDG forum in Kenya, UNESCO, UNICEF, you name it. Uh, they were all there, and I was even told the Minister for ICT would be visiting this hackathon, so it was a huge success. And when I asked them, so when's the next one, they said, oh, we're planning another one in November, so I'm hoping this is going to be an ongoing initiative. And the plan for Africa is we would really love to uh, partner with uh, Deep Learning in Dava Fair, because I know they're already, um, the Dava X mini conference is happening in 26 countries in Africa, so we want to partner with 10 of them um, in 2020, and then scale this way and really run around those uh, hackathons and uh, meetups for teenagers alongside conferences. This way we can tap into the students, into the young data scientists and machine learning technologies and at the same time pass on that knowledge to the younger generation. So I'm really excited about it and at the same time we are having some projects uh, that we are in partnership with Microsoft. So we're here at the Reactor but we also ran hackathons in the Reactor places in San Francisco, New York um, and Seattle. Um, and so, with that in mind, I know James should be somewhere. <laughs> All right, James, if you'd like to welcome everybody to the Reactor space, and I'll just record the video that I want to show you. Hi, everyone. Uh, 
Hi everyone, uh, thank you for coming in. So I have the pleasure of running the Raptor in, in London. Uh, can I just have a hands up aside from the team? Has anyone else been here before? A few, yeah. okay, that's good, cool. So um, for those who don't know, we are kind of designed as a bit of a hub for developers and startups in London. Uh, it's a space which is free for kind of community activities. Uh, and really what Microsoft's all about is kind of engaging with different communities around technically based events. So this has been perfect. We've loved having you guys here for three days. It's definitely been one of our easier hacks, but um, we're grateful for you guys spending your time with us. Um, if any of you would like to kind of stay up to date with what we've got coming on, um, our website is microsoftreactor.com. We've also got a meetup page on meetup which you can join and then you can kind of follow any kind of upcoming events there. We run a lot of technical events um, in the evenings, weekends, and so on, um, which you guys are more than welcome to attend. So if it's an open RSVP, you can go to the website and come across those. So thank you for coming. I look forward to seeing the results. Cool. Thank you so much. So um, over the last 10 days, teenagers have uh, gone through what usually a typical startup uh, goes through 12 weeks. So we've incubated them for 10 days, we've given them uh, the kind of stuff that Harry would normally teach them in 12 weeks. So they are exhausted, that I know for sure. I think uh, in the last few days there have been less and less messages on that WhatsApp group. But I started coaching them 10 days before the accelerator and they have this very long list of things they had to watch, they had to read, and these were TED Talks, they were or up to date articles of what's happening in the ethics, what's happening in the AI in health tech and whatnot. But let me show you what we've been doing in the first, I believe it's the first seven days. And I just wanted to say um, a huge thank you to everyone who supported us. You will see a lot of community faces there, the mentors and also the um, uh, Sanchez hosts in the first three days. So that a lot of the stuff that you can see that will be will have been shot in the Sanchez studios. But it's, uh, the progress has been fascinating. <laughs> Each one of them has a very powerful story to tell, and I hope some of these stories will come, come through. So they've all been um, interviewed, some of them um, on Skype. We have one international student here. Last year we had somebody from Bosnia. This time we have somebody from France. It was, say hi. So, um, so that's what uh, they have been doing, and I wanted to share with you very briefly uh, the, the agenda that we have had, which was uh, very, uh, very intense. It looked like this. So, just so you know what your, the children were up to, because I know there are parents here who I don't know whether that you know what they were actually even learning, because we were only in touch with the kids, but also for the judges. Uh, so we've had three days of design thinking, where we really didn't touch any code, because we wanted them to understand 
what the problem is um, before they want to solve it. So we're very grateful to Accenture for hosting the first three days and BBC for hosting the third um, day for half of the day when we also heard about fake news. Um, you know, had a tour of BBC, which was um, amazing, but in the first three days, all they did was, what is the problem, how do I know what the problem is, um, you know, what are the existing solutions out there, and, and how, you know, how bad, how great is that problem. So the challenges they've had were climate change, health and well-being, and education, um, and it was uh, down to the teams to really choose how they wanted to narrow it down. So I know a few teams have pivoted, probably some of them on days three and four, but there were a few that um, stayed you know, with whatever they wanted to solve from the very beginning. So it was a very interesting um, process. So as you can see, we had uh, speakers in the morning and speakers in the afternoon, sometimes uh, you know, speakers in the, uh, during the lunch hour as well, but most of the time, uh, everything that's in blue is technology, a lot of technology. Uh, so. They've all had at least uh, four or five sessions, I believe, in uh, machine learning. So they were with Peter, with uh, Sondes, over there, um, so Chihan and a few other mentors. So we had uh, beginners, uh, intermediate and advanced machine learning groups who were learning independently about technologies. And each one of them have learned about different kinds of stuff. Um, what else? Yes, a lot of technology, um, as you can see, but that just gives you an idea of what they were doing um, every day. So the first three days were hosted by Accenture, which was amazing. And so we worked uh, with in Liquid Studio with uh, innovation and design experts. Um, the next three days we were at Wire, and then we were saved by <laughs> uh, Julianne, who opened doors to us on a Saturday, because uh, we just had a conflict uh, where we would be. And suddenly, rework offered us um, to host us, and then in the last three days, they were here at Microsoft Reactor. So, what I would like to, uh, to do next is to very briefly show you what the questionnaire was, just for you to see um, the kind of um, questions that Peter has designed. Peter, do you want to say hi? Raise your hand. He always sits with hydroponics team. So, the worst you can be one of you. Um, so these were the essay questions and, uh, and the maths. The maths um, terrified um, a lot of the parents, uh, let alone uh, teenagers, and I've actually had quite a few emails from some very, very well-known parents in the AI space who said to me, um, I, I refuse to send, my, send this test to my children because it will intimidate them, I know that. So um, maybe in the next accelerator we will do a two-step process. Maybe um, yeah, because this test uh, I know many just came back and said, "Well, I just can't do that, that maths, uh, whatever that is." And um, yeah, and these are all real people in the test as well. So that was fun. So how many of you found the test very hard? <laughs> Julia tried it. Uh, so, you see, um, Julia tried it, he found it hard. So, yeah, so whenever I, when, when I started uh, this program, I said, you know, you can all shoot Peter because he's just there. So, but then by the end of the accelerator, everyone loves it because he's the, um, you know, the, the fun, the, the energy of the, of the program. And, and so everyone then realizes that he's the person. So the speakers, so these are uh, the speakers. So there were over 30 speakers, I believe, who came um, to inspire our young people. And they were all um, experts in so many different domains, in health, um, technology, in um, data, sci data scientists. Um, Jessica came from NHSX to talk to them. Um, as well, so we had um, teaching workshops. We had George Alingaya from BBC who visited um, us uh, when we were at Wira. We had um, five or six speakers from BBC who were incredible. Uh, we went in AI and BBC Voice America was there. Um, and uh, we had Googlers, we had obviously um, Element AI, so you name it. I think we pretty much ticked every single box. We even had um, Anthony Briggs from, um, who was an admiral, who came and spoke to us uh, about AI in, in military and also about his journey. Um, and we had quite a number of ethicists who joined us. Um, and today, I believe the, the ending of the accelerator was a talk about gender and AI by, by Natasha. 
So, um, what I would like to do next is I really would like to uh, thank the team that is behind this program because obviously many people think it's just me doing all this stuff running around the world. Um, you know, working with kids and actually takes many more people to, to pull this all off. So I want to um, get my team up and say, uh, just to acknowledge them um, and thank them because they were doing a lot of the background work for me, Natasha. Uh, I Uh, and next, I want to get all the mentors who have done so phenomenally, phenomenally who have been helping and supporting. So, um, Sajita, Sajanta, Iman, Sondes, um, everyone. So, Diana. <laughs> and mentioning that, so we have uh, technology mentors, but also design thinkers, um, and many of them came um, every day just to, to spend time with children, so that, you know, you need to be incredibly passionate in order to do this. So the companies that have supported us um, this year uh, are obviously um, Accenture, um, Element AI, but we've had a lot of uh, mentors from Benevolent AI, from uh, Alfido, uh, Tech Nation, so ICR came and offered a challenge and eventually one of the teams decided to tackle it. Um, but uh, it was very exciting. Uh, I know I mean, MasterCard is support us all the time, but it was a pleasure to work with all the mentors. Uh, we had to pick all mentors. We've had over 100 applications from mentors, and we literally selected them based on the expertise we needed in the room, based on the challenges, um, and also the experience they had. So it was quite an intense <laughs> process that takes uh, more than four months to select the kids, the speakers, and everyone else. Um, quite an effort. Um, and so what I would like to now do is remind uh, the teams and everyone around um, me what the criteria is. I will then introduce all the judges and we will then start with team one, the educator who should be ready by now. Because I've given you a lot of time of, uh, of the wall. So uh, the judges will be looking at the teamwork um, implementation, um, originality, technical complexity and obviously social impact. So uh, for me, because it's an AI company accelerator, uh, the last criteria is the most important one, but because we're tackling, uh, dealing with AI and AI technologies, technical complexity will also be appreciated, and we have two judges here who will scrutinize um, um, and they will be very strict about it. So hopefully, as one of the two will surprise us and has developed something that does not exist or has shown some unique um, application, um, we definitely want to see that it um, it is easily implementable. So UX is really important, and team work, obviously, the way you present it, the tell the judges or not. All right. So, um, and I'm going to start with Harris. So maybe you could um, say who you are, um, you know, where you're from, and what you're looking for. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Harry Davis, I'm from Tech Nation, which is a government backed body that supports the, the tech sector in the UK and its entrepreneurs. Um, so I, I'm really looking for, and I've had a few of these now, I guess, but I, I always, I'm always inspired by uh, a number of ideas that come out. Um, there's always um, much thought that goes into the, the impact that the ideas create, um, and you're tackling uh, really, really admirable things in climate change and education this year. So really, really keen to see the social impact and to see how you're making that a reality. Hello, I'm John Spinlock. I am the founder of a fund called AIC. We invest uh, long way around £200,000 in uh, early stage AI companies and sitting on from our universities. But I am here to see that the university is too late. I should be investing even earlier. So I'm looking to be wild and impressed by a great team building great technology, solving great problems. Hi, good afternoon everybody, my name's Paul Truman, I'm at, uh, I'm at MasterCard, um, and for those of you who kind of know what we do, we're out there helping you kind of tap the payment, but actually you probably don't know that the AI is used on our network every day, and 75 billion transactions a year happen across the network, and they all go through AI models on the network all the time, and that pretty much defines how we save tens of billions of dollars for everybody every year when fraud is taking place, so that's how we see it, we, we work everywhere from, we have big teams, I think some of the teams last year went to San Francisco, we also have a big field in Singapore and also in India working on internal problems on AI as well as customer problems. So 
really looking forward to seeing what you're going to do today. Yeah, absolutely. Make sure you wear us. And you know, you've been working really hard, but remember, this is the duck into the line. Make sure you cross the tape. So I want to see you do a really good job on this. So hi everybody, I'm Leticia Caneto, I'm the Liquid Studio Director, so I'm owning the space in Berlin the first three days uh, uh, of, of the challenge. Uh, in Accenture, I'm the global lead for conversational AI, so I guess you would have seen a lot of those chatbots, and virtual agents, and voice bot, and voice AI. So this is kind of my day-to-day -day job to kind of make computers more human. Um, so you, you, know, you don't have to learn the computer anymore, it's the computer that learns the person in front of you. Um, I'm also uh, part of the reserve group at the uh, European Commission uh, for the, uh, the group responsible to do the uh, AI uh, guidelines and the policy and the framework. Uh, so today I'll be looking quite carefully at how ethical and non-biased you are in your, uh, in your, in your projects. So I'm very excited to, uh, to see all of that. <coughs> Hi everyone, I'm Julian. You've seen way too much of me already, both on the first day and on uh, Saturday. So just to put an extra layer, uh, I'm a director of research at uh, NMDF. I'm a little one in the back. Um, <laughs> and I have the privilege to be working on the space of AI for good uh, daily with a fantastic team, including uh, Freddie, who's been a mentor here. And mostly, most of my job is to show that there's better things to do with our brains and our technology than ads and finance. And essentially, I'm super excited to see that you are all already getting in that direction. Today, my role will be to kick the tires from a technical point of view and uh, dig into the technical aspects of what you do, and I'm really excited to see that. Uh, hey all, uh, my name is Alejandro Salcedo. Uh, I am a technology director at Selden. Uh, this is an open source machine learning deployment uh, company. I also lead the Institute for Ethical AI and Machine Learning which is a group of experts that dive into uh, best practices for uh, um, uh, responsible uh, use of machine learning. I'm very looking forward to uh, judging some of the ideas that I'm sure are going to be changing uh, uh, the world in the next few years. Um, so, looking forward. Hello, uh, my name is Sabina Zanko. I am the uh, digital strategy for IBM. So, we work on our around digital transformation and emerging technologies do most of the time in combination, so AI, blockchain, analytics, and robotics. Um, I think uh, my focus at IBM right now has been to actually change the way we address opportunities, uh, not only from a tech focus, but really being holistic, and I'm going to have the same focus today. So I'm going to be interested in understanding the end level position. I'm going to be interested in understanding how you're going to unlock value for the business models and how you have to scale, how you're going to transform this into a, a real business and what could go wrong. Uh, so the articulation about that. Thank you. Hello, my name is Rosalind Quezon Marcus. I'm representing McKinsey and Quantum Lab. I'm very interested in how you guys think about, first of all, how you think, because that's the, the number one value that we would put on painting at McKinsey. Second is social impact, how you're thinking about scale, economies of scale, how you are thinking about the impact that, you, that these ideas will have on other people. Um, McKinsey is very interested in starting to collaborate at a much younger level. So I will obviously be thinking about it if any of you are huge McKinsey partners. <laughs> and last but not least, um, we've got Talisa joining us. She's uh, not the best time to judge. No, I, I, think I, I think I might have judged this almost every time we've been here. So thank you for having me. And I, um, I love doing this for them because I get so inspired and daunted by how busy you all are. Um, I am looking for, for, for lots of things, but I think probably the most useful thing to say is um, I run a conference called COPEX, which brings together um, thousands of people from the industry, government, um, and they really need to hear how cool you all are. So I'm always looking for ideas that I think you can present there. Um, and ways that I can help you uh, expand your ideas beyond just today. So I'm really 
thrilled to get to see all your projects. Thanks for being here. So I know Jessica will be watching us, um, watching the live stream because um, she was really, really interested, particularly in the, the health tech um, uh, ideas. Um, Chris is abroad, and I know Katie is running late, but I'm happy with the judges that have sat here. I'm ready to begin. All right. So the first team that I am going to invite um, to be is educator. So, just very briefly, you have three minutes to pitch and two minutes for the judges' questions. Uh, when it's one minute left, uh, Liz is going to lift that. Attention. We'll let you know it's one minute, and this is the time that we need to All right. Okay. So three minutes. It said, if you want to change the world, start with the children. So we are educator. So the problem is is that children, um, that problem-solving skills are one of the core skills needed to succeed in today's world. However, children are being taught these skills um, separately from other subjects and at too late of an age. So we are introducing Educator, which is preparing preschoolers for their future using an app and a study. So here is our first prototype of the game. For example, if the children hear the, the word Ted, they will form the words with the grid and using the arrows. The word Ted you see there will be replaced by an image, and we also have a, a teddy bear that is linked to the app that will speed it. So we'll talk about a more about that. So meet your new best friend. This is a teddy bear which would which the child would be able to name, and it would have a speaker inside to add to the sensory learning experience. So whenever the child spells a word correctly, um, the teddy would say the word and would ask the child to repeat it. There would be a microphone which would listen to the child and would, um, then the AI would be able to see which sounds the child is not using correctly and then ask similar words with similar sounds. This is some code for that. And 2,090,000. That is a big number, and that's just the amount of children aged three to five, just in England and Wales. And who are we going to sell this product to? We've spoken to the CEO of Montessori, and she said that she's interested in this idea of technology and learning coming together as one. We're also going to sell B2B to nurseries and preschools, and B2C to parents of young children. And this is kind of a quick idea of how much we're going to sell everything for. So if we reach, if we reach only 1% of this inflation, we could generate potentially 80,000 pounds. And here's the way with only 5%. So is this a viable market? Since there are so many other companies that are trying to do similar things, um, yes, it's a viable market. And there's a big demand for personalized learning in the industry. Um, so, Cubetto, Codepillar, and Codehopper are some of our competitors, but they are much more expensive and less portable than we are. Um, what makes us special? We're quite easy for teachers to use and for children to understand. And we also offer personalized learning, so that you can, the AI will adapt to what the student finds hard and make that like more of a reoccurring kind of word, for example. We also integrate straight into the curriculum, so you don't have to go out of your way to learn. Is this like a separate um, idea? And we are quite easily scalable. And this is the team that will make it happen. So now we need your help with mentoring in app developer, uh, education expert, and mentoring in artificial intelligence. Let's change the world. Let's start with the children. Thank you.
question from the judges. Who wants to start? Um, so I guess uh, what would be interesting is uh, it seems like you guys have managed to, to build something in a very short period of time. What do you think would be your next immediate steps from the technical standpoint? I guess also uh, with the consideration that you're uh, dealing with a uh, potentially sensitive market and you're going to have a tech bear listening to uh, everything that you know is happening on that side. So we would have a dashboard which would let the teacher track each child's progress and also to turn the microphone on and off when the child wants to use it. And uh, like our next steps, basically we would like to kind of get the teddy bear link and like put this microphone in, connect it all to an app and it, like start kind of just using the language to create a Um, you mentioned for your go-to-market that you do B2C and B2B. But which one first? Because obviously it's, it can be quite different. We would go B2B first to the nursery. We, we've already spoken to the CEO of Montessori, and she said that she's interested in this idea if we like to make it and go through with it. So we're thinking of maybe partnering with them at first and then see how it goes with them. Okay. How would you democratize this product. So, Montessori is a private school. How are you thinking about making it um, accessible to state school children or others who, who this technology but can afford it? At first, like, we would like to kind of set it up and get it going, but then maybe do a partnership with the government, for example, make a more kind of Maybe budget version, so uh, I'll just go back to this bit. Like you can purchase, uh, just get the app for let's say one pound fifty per student, rather than paying more for the teddy as well. And but you don't have that physical interaction; you just have the virtual interaction, uh, which is kind of this kind of effect. Do you think you're potentially excluding some children from but without invention? In, in some way, some children maybe can't speak as well, or um, you know, they have you know, autism and things like that. So, have you thought about this angle of inclusion? Yeah, we would in, include like children who speak other languages to teach them English as well, and also children who stutter so that the um, Teddy can still understand what they're saying. Then Teddy could also act as like a uh, chatbot, for example, like you can talk to Teddy. If you have, for example, a social interaction problems, you can talk to Teddy and it can kind of help you build that skill up. Uh, I think my Teddy still does speak to me, so congratulations, at least you brought it into the 21st century. Um, I, I think you did a great job here, and I, I've got no questions about the main part. The one thing I would say is you made some great impacts at the start and the middle and the end. You really took your story really well. Be careful when you get to slides that actually you're going to go through so quick we can't even see them. The question you should be asking yourself is do you need that slide in there? So focus on the ones that really make the point, but I think you started really, really well, so well done. Can you show the post to Alejandro and us? Oh yeah, I'm already. Oh, you're looking at the project, okay. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions? Well, let's take go.
Climate change is a real issue and it's happening now. We believe the reason for the sea way climate change is happening is due to our carbon footprint. So when I say carbon footprint, what comes into mind? to Green Feast. Green Feast is an integrated web extension that raises awareness about your food carbon footprint, provides alternatives that are more eco-friendly, and will save you, the user, money. So this is the live page, which in the future, any customer will be able to download Green Feast for free. Once you've downloaded Green Feast, our deep learning will go through your online receipt and extract all of the food that you've bought. This means the next time you go online shopping, you'll get an alert from Green Feast and it will show you different alternatives you can use that are more eco-conscious. So how do we have these alternatives? We have created a database with food that you frequently buy on using online shopping, as well as a machine learning model that tells you more that will, that will add new produce to you and that will help you give you more alternatives. So, who's a team guy? It's a great idea. So I'm Josh and I'm the finance guy. <laughs> I'm Izzy and I'm in charge of backend development. I'm Valentino, I'm the CMO and I'm in charge of front-end development. I'm Radhika and I'm in charge of research and data analysis. So, in the future, we wish to partner with manufacturers like Nestle so we can increase their data transparency and use that to create a more effective rating system where we will include other factors like plastic usage and animal treatment. We also wish to partner with companies like Tesco so we can integrate our product into every customer's shopping experience. In order to accomplish this, we'd like to get more expertise from people who've worked with web development and web extensions, whether that be back or front-end development, in order to grow our business. So, in conclusion, Greenfeast is a free, easy-to-use, integrated and automated web extension which can help you reduce your carbon footprint. If you want to know more, we'll be here after the pictures, then you can also check out our socials. Thank you for listening. Really well done. I mean, if ever there was a problem that everybody's looking at at the moment and trying to work out where solutions are needed, this is one. So, so really well done thinking about carbon footprint. Um, you said that you thought the target was the manufacturers, the Nestle's, etc. Um, but you're actually looking at substituting food. Is there, are there other people you could be targeting, or why did you choose manufacturing over the other type of thing for that? Um, so, we'll target manufacturers. So, at the moment, we're just a uh, web extension, but in the future, we want to also go to businesses so we can make sure they are reducing their carbon footprint and helping to solve climate change. Because first we want to raise awareness, so the best way to do that is go to the customers, but then after that, to make it more easy for everyone to access, we're going to go to the Tesco, Sainsbury's, all the manufacturers, so hopefully it comes to the market. So maybe I think if you're looking for opportunity, you might get quicker if you go straight to the retailers. The retailers then can have sway over everybody else, and they can also find what they'll want to do is substitute things, but they'll kind of want to substitute things that are in their shop, not in somebody else's shop. So I just want to think about it if you want to make it happen. Right, yeah, we said that. We're really great finish. And you know, and, and reiterate, it's a great point to be tapping. I mean, 25% stat that put in there was, was fantastic. It was a really, really shocking stat. So really well done and emphasized is a problem. Um, we're really happy to solve. Um, what, what factors go into your eco score, would you say? How do you determine if the food is more um, eco friendly than another? 
So currently we use the distance and where it's going to, to the shop so that. But we want to, so that's why in the future we want to work with the companies. So let's say if we know where they grow it and how um, they grow it, we can give an accurate score or find out just one score what, what the data we have. So it's all about the growth and how we can uh, get our screening pretty soon. Thank what about meat? I mean, meat is not in a huge carbon footprint, even if it's grown locally, I guess. How did you kind of consider that angle into your basket? Um, right now, we're not considering it because obviously it's such a contested market in the food industry that none of the data is really transparent. So, hopefully, my partner in food manufacturers will be able to access that and help them with more reliability. Seven. <laughs> nice okay, great. I mean, yeah, the other man thought. Um, have you thought of using other technologies as well? I mean, we talked about machine learning, but in this case, the traceability uh, of food could be interesting. So, for instance, blockchain could actually be a reference. Um, we did actually reach out to Providence, and yeah, we're trying to get in touch with them because obviously they do things like that. And we have been considering that, obviously. We haven't used it yet, but so um, I could definitely um, discuss and put in touch with the IBM Food Trust, uh, which actually uh, incorporates a number of retailers in the world and, and really works on this topic. I have a second question. Uh, can you give me an example of other uh, competitors that are doing something similar? Um, so at the moment, it's a pretty empty market, but there are some other apps on the app store which you can download, which you can scan uh, or see to find out its uh, carbon footprint. But there's nothing like us which is automated and there's not much manual input. Um, and also with the apps, it just tells you how much like, carbon footprint like, it, each product gives you, but it never uh, offers alternatives, so it's much harder to find alternatives when using the apps because it's much to know quite quickly like, what's, been, what's better for the environment. Have you thought about marketing or I'd like to hear your thoughts about how you would market? Um, so at the moment we're just trying to reach out to people on social medias, but we're also contacting big companies so we can try and get them involved and let them know. Have a little look at a company called Economy. They're running out of, um, out of Scandinavia at the moment. They're doing some work on a thing called the Island Index, which looks at merchant clubs. And they try and work out what the value of carbon offset is versus money spent. It's in a slightly different area, but I know there are people like the NCS Institute in connect with who are doing it, but not in this way. So, this is the issue of this. So, which ones the mentors have helped you? Do you remember? The mentors, the technology mentors? So we have Caroline, Jihan, I don't know and then Caroline is here. Thank you, and Jihan and Freddie who saved you <laughs> when, when you were pivoting. So there was a time, I think it was day seven, seven when this team still were not sure because they wanted to take a common footprint from day one, but then on day six I told them I don't want to use paper, I don't want to come home and scan a receipt menu and said I want something that reads all data and does things automatically and daily and then they came they were very upset <laughs> and uh, Freddie was the one that came uh, to mentor on that day um, and saved his team and they decided maybe it's going to have to be a Chrome extension thank you so much so well done well done to all the mentors um, who participated So next up is um, hydroponics. So if you don't know what hydroponics is, it's still will tell you all about it. Okay. So this is the first time we're playing with, um, with hardware. Usually it's um, most of software. Some software is more complicated than others. Um, but this time, um, one of the teams decided to take it out um, Okay, so we just need a different laptop for this one. Um, 
see a guy's name he tells me. The world is sleepwalking into a global food crisis. In a rapidly expanding population, farms are increasingly under more pressure to meet the demands of the people. How can farms, with their traditional farming methods, which are resource intensive and ineffective, cope with the demands of the people? The solution is hydroponics. Hydroponics is farming without soil, where the plants are grown directly into water and the nutrients required are pumped directly into them. Hydroponics has many advantages in comparison to conventional farming. For example, it grows, there's a 300% yield that it creates per unit of land and it uses 90 percent less water. In addition to this, it uses a quarter of the land that conventional farming uses. Furthermore, we believe that our product has great potential in the hydroponics market. This is because the hydroponic market is expected to be 35 billion by 2025, while it's currently 24 billion. This is a 46% increase over the next five years. However, there are still some huge challenges to overcome in hydroponics today. For example, root rot. In fact, when we conducted an interview with a commercial hydroponics farmer, he said that one of the main challenges to overcome were managing the conditions especially water temperature. So we set about trying to tackle that problem. We came up with hydroponics.ai, an AI system that monitors and regulates the conditions on your hydroponics farm. Not only is it more efficient, it is also more cost effective for farmers because it uses less resources such as light and water, which might otherwise be wasted. It also gets more people into hydroponics because um, using our system means that you don't need a background in hydroponics farming. Currently, we offer two subscription models on farms. One contains um, the software, um, and the other contains the, the software and hardware that we provide. So this is a prototype of our app. So the farmer would log in, and um, here they have the option of all the vegetables we're growing, and see the status of all the plants. Um, so here's our software architecture. At the bottom we have hardware such as sensors and heaters, which will be in the hydroponics farm. Here we have the front end, which will be the user interface of applications, web applications, and in the back end we have the machine learning. So these are some graphs that we got from our simulation. And this we will use this simulation to train our AI using reinforcement learning to grow plants as efficiently as possible. Uh, so here we are um, building our mini hydroponics farm so that we can test that AI and also connecting the sensors to the raspberry Pi for the electronics. Our main competitor and potential partner is Flux IoT. They monitor hydroponic plants. However, we monitor and regulate hydroponic plants and we provide them the optimal option to, um, in which their plants are conditioned. So what now? We want to further develop our hardware as currently it's very basic and therefore we in hardware, business and AI as well. 
feel free to contact us if you have any questions about our product and we would love if you would like to help us carry this project forward. Together, we can stop global food crisis. Thank you for listening. Really, really impressive. Um, that looks uh, very interesting, especially I like the specificness of the problem you guys are tackling. Um, in terms of the um, amount of work that you managed to do this week, uh, from what you managed to build, what is the tangible uh, code and hardware that you managed to put together? So currently, we have like a part of the simulation. The other issue was just on this, like finding one of the papers that describe the equation, because that's very important. Of, like how light affects both. And in addition, we are also tackling with like how heat energy is lost throughout the system, which requires a lot more knowledge and uh, the use of uh, finite element uh, models. So okay. we will have to use those as well. Uh, in addition to this, uh, you can kind of see over there the, our uh, slight model of our mini hydroponics farm. So you can see there's a water pump and then two pots of water. You can't really see clearly, but these are all the wires. That's what we're testing it. Awesome. Amazing, very good job. Which IoT device did you use to do the sensing? And, and do you think 5G is going to be important for your uh, uh, product? Oh, so for the sensing, we use simple water sensors and uh, light, uh, light, how was it? Yeah, LRTR, LTR, sorry. And we, for getting that data, we used a Raspberry Pi, which we had to carry. And 5G will be very useful because it allows us to reach certain areas which currently don't have maybe Wi-Fi. So that can mean that we have a, a larger a market or yeah, larger user user base. I mean, you're knocking out the park this year. That's just fantastic. So I think this is great. I think it's the first one I've seen where you brought practical elements. Well done for putting the video in. Next time, leave the root block out. That one be super. Um, <laughs> but I, 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 I have another look at your numbers as well. One, one thing I thought you said is that hydroponics made 24 billion by 2035 billion. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, let's let's up those numbers like tenfold. <laughs> yeah. Let's have a look and say we can't sustain farming like it is. And farming is inefficient. Therefore, if you put the numbers in, the number of people move to hydroponics. Hydroponics is going to be ten times that figure. So give yourself some credit. It's not just the growth of 24 to 35. It sounds big. In general terms, you're way bigger than that. So great idea. Yeah. Uh, another really, really strong pitch. Well done. Um, it's, it's a really fascinating use case. I mean, what what gave you the inspiration in the first place, and how did you come to, to choose this as your idea? So we were looking at food shortage, shortage, and we were researching the different ways of growing plants, and we came across hydroponics and saw that it was already quite efficient, but there were quite a few problems and that uh, we could solve this quite easily with AI technology and so we thought that hydroponics were a good fit for us. Really impressive, but uh, the idea of using RL to handle a farm has really reminds me of the use of RL for uh, data center power usage. Uh, and I would love seeing it to, to use for actually feeding people. Um, quick question on the on the RL side. What are the obstacles you foresee to using RL? So basically, what can make RL fail in your case, and what is your mitigation strategy for that? Uh, so RL, RL, was it RL or RL? Uh, is a very long process, and it's also done so that the code. Um, step by not step by step, but it's got a little bit of rewards on the way to the final reward, and so therefore we're trying to use the simulation in another way to just help it learn to be as efficient as possible. And if I also don't work, what's your backup strategy? Loads of if statements. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> this is actually an excellent answer. A rule-based system as a backup, simple and yet top down, is a valid backup solution. So I was impressed on how you introduced the idea and the opportunity based on pain points that you have served. Um, I want to go back to, you mentioned two go-to-market model. One is software, and one is software plus hardware. How did you come to this conclusion? Who are your customers for both offers? 
So we're currently targeting the financial farm because we believe they will have the greatest outreach in um, the problem with the uh, pollution population. Um, so we think that we, we just, um, and also our strategy is mainly word of mouth because most most farmers trust each other. So we want to have a recommendation system whereby farmers who use our system and then recommend it to another farm will then get a, a percentage discount off their next month of their subscription. And so here we can reach many more farms because farmers now have an incentive to tell other farms about what we're doing. So we want to reach um, most of our farms through word of mouth. Well, in addition to this, uh, we were thinking of working with charities uh, because they have a very good um, outreach and so then so we can help with our problem with food shortage. Yeah. If successful, how are you thinking about scaling <coughs> in the long term? Scaling. What are some of your aspirations maybe internationally? So um, we have our, we, our, we've mainly developed our software so far and we think that's easily um, accessible around the world. So the main thing that we need to develop is our hardware, at which will be much harder. So we need to develop our own sensors and our own hardware. So at the moment we're using a Raspberry Pi or a mini computer. Whereas if we can get our own hardware in, we can easily um, ship it around the world for different farms just to use our packaging without needing to combine their sensors with our software. We can, we can give farms the entire packaging, package so it's easier to set up. The next question I was expecting, which I didn't hear, was when do I invest? <laughs> okay, right, off you go, next team. So the next team is show. Um, I know you want to move to the top of your desktop. So what problems we're solving? Our main problem that we're aiming to tackle is quality education, which is the UN development goal 4.8, which is looking to give a safer environment for schools. How are we actually going to do this? Well, firstly, we're going to look at tackling bullying prevention. So did you know that people who are bullied are twice as likely to bully others? To stop this from happening, we're first going to have to give those people emotional support and actually break this cycle of bullying. And hopefully by doing that, we're going to reduce the amount of bullying that happens, but also help those people go and get them that emotional support that they need. I have a question for the judges. Raise your hand if you have kids, kids, or if you're expecting. So did you know that 54% of young people under the age of 25 have admitted to being bullied at some point in their life? So that's quite lovely. We also carried out a survey and we found that our results were similar to the results of the survey on the previous slide. So our solution is a platform for those people to reach and get that moral support from a chatbot. 
We're actually going to go through a slide demo now. It's done. So um, we thought instead of just explaining how it works, we're going to show you a real life uh, demo. So to kind of explain on a high level basis, we have the user input. So the user will type something in like you and is, and he's saying, I'm feeling sad. Now what happens is the website will send this data to a Microsoft platform called Lewis, which will help understand the language and the sentiment, i.e. this user's too happy and sad. Now what we have, we have several Q&A maker bases, another Microsoft platform used for communication, question and answering. We um, link up the user to the relevant platform and we get the response. And in this case, it's don't feel sad, what has made you so sad? Now, by doing this, we create uh, another level of customization for the user and we hope to implement uh, memory uh, in the future. Now the chatbot so far uh, is using memory in such a way as we are. And also notice it's very accessible. Uh, we try to keep the users confidential, like online, and we try to make it as simple to use as we can. Also, um, the USP. So we have personalized experience that explains memory bots. So as far as we know, no other chatbot is doing what we're doing right now. And um, it's going to be a continuous learning process. For example, if the bot hasn't seen, so let's say, cyberbullying before, it will learn, share this data, but we have to be careful. So we're going to try and um, anonymize every user that's uh, linking to our service, uh, give them random hashes, and try and make that whole process as simple as we can. Our competition. We downloaded and tested many mental health apps on the market and don't have the same, um, the same current unique now, the business model. So we're going to try and target organizations like schools, homes, online, workplace, see a correlation, show. Anyway, so we deploy it to organizations and they'll, um, this is a subscription-based service, a business-to-business -business company service. So um, we'll give each for uh, X number of um, indexes, IDs to link onto our online platform. Um, we try and outreach by going to um, uh, sell PSHE lectures that are happening in schools, and uh, pricing for this will be around two hundred pounds per um, um, per term for each school. Um, but it is quite hard to price this since we are one of the first people to implement the model in such a way. So we do need your help. You need to be provided your data set so we can continue to train our model, as well as our help, mentors who can. How much of the actual thinking and solutions? Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you for listening. We hope you can ask uh, a few questions because we definitely wanted to speak a lot more about our project, but we didn't really get the time. Thank you. Awesome. Um, so very interesting to see. I mean, I am, I'm quite impressed. You know, when you go to uh, grown-up uh, events, you get to see less code than in this ones. So uh, you guys are really uh, are, are setting the bar. Um, I guess from the technical perspective, what was the areas that you struggled the most while supporting the system? So um, it was really getting the information and resources to these kind of platforms. So one of our mentors, Caroline, here, helped us uh, reach out into Microsoft Lewis and uh, Microsoft Q&A Maker, which helped us link in you know, this front-end development, some basic Apex tooling. We managed to get that whole thing set up together. Yeah, she helps with documentation, and the rest of it is just nitty gritty, looking into what we can do next, kind of thing. Thank you. And um, that is obviously a, a very interesting topic. I think the AI can, can help a lot. I think one of the challenges, though, with mental health and giving advice to people that are in stress is to make sure you give the right advice. So where are you sourcing your advice and content from in terms of the responses? Uh, and how do you make sure you, you know, you're not aggravating the situation? Um, so Rachel's mum was actually a nurse dealing with mental health. So we've actually been asking her a lot of advice on this matter to make sure we get it right and stuff like that. So, but also on that matter, that's why we need a bit more help with ethics because we don't want that fact that if it goes wrong, it, we, we have to deal with that. So we have to think a lot more about it. That's why we need some help with the ethics in particular. Also, we've been speaking to some other mental health mentors, and they recommend we use certain practices and regulate, regu regulations. Uh, for example, using open, really ended questions, and using questions called PHQ-9s, which will help give us more credibility when we are applying to answers, and make us less accountable if something does happen. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you.
also with some PHQ9 questions, we're going to use that as like a metric as well. So they have ranges between like the max score is 27, so between 24 and 27 is like extreme cases. So what we will do is in the future, if we measure that our actual number is working, we're going to be using that to make sure that maybe in a week's time has their number went down or have we seen an improvement due to our app. What's your memory architecture in the chatbot? The memory so um, we have, um, we're looking to create it. So we're initially thinking we're going to use some kind of session storage thing, cookies, uh, start on a really basic level. But later on, implement the login system based on organizations. But the key thing is here, we have to be in line with um, um, certain terms and conditions. So we want to try and hash users so they're as anonymous as they can be. And we look at um, certain entities that would be involved, not relate them to a user on a user basis, but more on a group to group basis. Also, we're going to have a feature for people who don't want any personalization so that they can remain completely anonymous. So there will be a guest function, but we will give the people a notification saying you will not have that personal information, which is good for building that report, which we've done a lot of research into because building that report is really helpful for getting people to open up. Um, you mentioned you approach schools. Um, have you thought about the permission that you need um, for kids to interface with your software? It goes beyond the schools. How are you going to have the opt-in? Have you thought of the permission uh, that you need? Because it's not only the school's decision in this case. How are you going to get uh, students opt-in? So, um, there's a lot of rules with GDPR about opting in, so we have done, I've done a bit of research into it, but it's quite hard, especially with younger people, about doing that, so I've done a lot of research, but I haven't reached that point where I'm happy enough with it, so I would have to do a lot more before I actually start marketing it. So, that's why we also did ask a lot of people for help for the ethics, that's the main reason why we need the ethics help now, so that we can get to that market, market platform. Do you not think you need to involve also a parent separate, you know, in your, in your business proposition? Yeah, it, this is another issue. So we've been having a, a lot of uh, questionable things because if you're a kid and you're being bullied, you don't want to speak to your parents. As bad as it sounds, you know, you, you probably went through this, you don't really want to tell your parents. So we do want to keep it anonymous to a certain extent, but we do also have to consider questions about how do we get in contact when it gets to that certain extreme level with the parents, so there's a lot of options we've been thinking about where maybe you would have to put an emergency line in there or something like that, but there's a lot of questions we still have to answer. Um, just one, one thought, you may want to um, garner support from a lawyer that deals with GDPR issues to help you unbundle that. The second is, what if you get into a scenario, and I think you were starting to allude to this, where the bullying has gone on so far, so just your example, which says, I think I want to die, what would, what would be the, I guess, the next actions? The action for us, or action for the chapel? Or, just or, you know, how are you thinking about this, you know, if it's more than just chatting because I feel sad, but it's like actually, you know, this is quite serious. Well, if it gets to a serious stage, our chatbot, it says, we recommend you to talk to the SAS helpline. So it would um, it would assess the situation and say, um, listen, for example, suicide, good Samaritans, go talk to them. Also helpline and uh, they can talk to them and text them as well. So from a technical point of view, um, and to do with memory again, we're going to try and monitor their progress anonymously and say, okay, how can um, we get their intents what they're thinking about and see how they change as they progress through the chat and compare them average to them. Every time they talk, see, oh, um, have they got better, have they got worse? And um, have certain levels like severity. Oh, is he getting is his chats getting more serious? Are they getting more convenient? And kind of act accordingly and make sure you can go to credible sources that you said, um, good Samaritans, child line, whatever. Going back to privacy, so you're using uh, Azure uh, ML tool, so Azure ch Chatbot. There's been a few warning stories in the news about chatbots in general, or even you know, tools like Siri, etc. Because 
um, interactions with the user are actually sent to a bunch of emails to read. Uh, how did you, uh, have you dug into what are the terms and conditions of this chatbot that you are using uh, in terms of precisely keeping this information, which is kids' information, confidential? Um, I, there's an NHS library, which I got from Jessica from NHSX, and they have a similar apps that aren't really that good. And when you log on to them, they seem to not really actually have that many terms and conditions, which kind of worries me quite a lot, because you would expect that that would be the main issue with we stuff with mental health and stuff. So I feel like it's something that a lot of companies right now aren't really looking into, and it's quite a worry. So that's something I definitely want to make sure that our team is on top of, especially before we even get to the market, we have to know everything about it. So it's something that I've researched a bit about, but I don't feel confident enough to have to answer your questions. So I'm sorry about that. But being honest, I feel like that's the best thing I can say to you. Yeah, it's a quite cool thing. And then the other topic I wanted to answer like that. So I think, yeah, no, we're on top of it. Don't worry. Right answer. All right, do we have a question? Okay. We, we have a question. Okay. Do it. Do it. Okay. Okay. Do, um, do any of you guys want to test out the chatbot? Any team you want to like that for? Any teams? Do you want to try? I want to test one. Do you guys know the console button? Yeah, that was a second. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's just a bit sideways. Yeah, it's just a bit sideways. The jarry racket is getting a bit loading. Jarry's a bit loading. He wants to find out what's next, right? I just want to do a quick demonstration right now. 
<laughs> so this is the, the output that we have. So the first main feature that we have is called Flexbook, and basically it's like a grouping system where friends can join up to basically create bike squad, squad like the name implies. So you can either create a bike squad by yourself, or you can, as we saw just now, you can just uh, join a bike squad with code. So let's create a bike squad. You want to invite these people, and then you put into this group, and as you can see, this is a weekly competition, and uh, because we're handling credit details, where the users are putting money into the prize pool, so that the person with the largest distance cycle at the end of the week will win the prize pool. We have two-factor authentication when the users want to forgot their password or something. Okay, I have a question. Yeah. What if I don't have a bank? Well, fair not, because we have a subscription system which we decided to temporarily call rent to buy And this is basically, you pay a set fee monthly, and you get a bike straight to your house, no hassle, and you can ride it until the end of the month, basically. But it's not safe to ride a bike in London. Well, actually, yeah, we also have a feature to help with that. So you go on the routing feature, type in where you want to go, somewhere, exactly. And then, if you're an inexperienced cyclist, you want to press the safest route. And then this is the metrics that we're considering. Zero hills, road conditions new, and no traffic. Simple round. And what we use is a machine learning module created by Michael and Caroline, which will uh, basically, you're going to go, and then you're going to finish your round. And uh, as a user, you're required to break the round out of five stars, so the machine learning module can learn what, what round is good for you and similar users. We're marketing to our target demographic in a variety of different ways. We're going to have adverts on tubes. Our, our social media has also been very active. So we've had 78 profile visits in the last seven days. We've also been commenting on posts that are really relevant to our subject, such as posts related to climate change. We're also going to have some, um, what's going to have some community initiatives where people can market our product by word of mouth and hopefully the hashtag bike zone. Well, what you want to know actually is who we actually are. So um, I'm Dennis, and I was the uh, I was the front end developer, so graphic design and stuff like that. My name is Michael. I was a back end developer, and I'm a marketing strategist. My name is Anishka, and I was the CMO. I really wanted to tackle climate change because I have a sister who suffers from asthma, and she always complains that she finds the air in London difficult to breathe. I wanted to change this. We want to thank you for listening to us and our products. We just have a few points and just, just things for you guys that help us with um, business mentorship, technology advisors, possible partnerships, um, software developers, and any developers of the country, the marketing specialists. And I hope that together we can all cycle to a green future. Thank you. For Um, so, I, um, from the study I showed, uh, was um, a few uh, wireframes. Uh, in terms of the um, piece that you mentioned from the front end side and back end side, um, what, what was it that you managed to put together during this week, and uh, what is going to be your focus, uh, immediate focus, in the next few weeks to get this to the next uh, level from the actual application standpoint? So in terms of front end, um, Dennis, I mean, said, was the very thing that a prototype. So that was a prototype we just saw. Um, back end wise, me and I was working with Caroline to build an AI module. Essentially, a uh, user will put, put in their name, their preferences, so such as if they like yours, if they're active person, and then our module will learn from their personality. So help them to recommend the route that it can take to work. Tell them, oh, don't go this way because. It's all heavy, the altitudes are high. I think you prefer this way because it's more of a calm ride. But yeah, it's, it's not the same for everyone. Because cyclists like so, so uh, as for the future, we would probably look for the software developers that can actually help us hard code the design. 
so that we can actually implement it as a legitimate app on the App Store. And it, it's, it's going to be free, so that it's more accessible to young people, because that's what we're targeting. Okay, so that's the there was a lot of good ideas in there. I, I just think you, you might want to focus down on, on the ones that matter to you. So you had bike clothes on in there, and I had you getting bike groups together. You're right, I'm one of those people that just said the desk. Um, but the, then you had this idea of competition between them, and then you had the idea that what they were doing was doing good to society because they were offsetting their carbon. That's a really cool one. But then you went on to bike car, and then you went on to ways for bicycles. Be, my only challenge on it is just be a little specific as to what you are going to focus on, and then you can add on all the services later on. If you're about the ozone, keep it in the ozone, it's really, really nice. I really I agree with that, and I think if you look at um, even just my journey from Walgate, how many bikes are between there and Walgate that are either docked in stations that have had their cycles, the jump bikes, they're, they're everywhere. There's something clever where you could actually link your, the idea that I, I personally am the ones that will just um, have carefully pulled out of the ways for bicyclists and actually giving people a safest route, you could tie that with the current trend of um, the fact that there are so many more bicycles out there on the street uh, and make it a bit safer. So I think there's a really good idea there that you can double down on. Um, and I'm sure there's someone here who can link you up with the Uber, the new bikes, or the uh, Santa Fe cycles. Yeah, well, what we were actually thinking of was partnering with uh, similar services so like Santa Fe and Mobax. And what we actually have is a specific uh, company that we would partner with, and it's called the Barrel Bikes. Oh, yeah. They actually, yeah, they yeah I, we know Andy very well. Uh, Are you connected? I can definitely introduce you to Emily. That's a company, <laughs> fantastic, actually. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> I, I love how it's like someone and I completely forgot I know Emily very well. Yes, of course. And, uh, yeah, because they actually offer pretty much the entire service that we want to integrate in our yeah. systems, it would be really great that we partner with them because it's actually a kind of small company that has a big research into it and uh, it will pretty much be a common kind of relationship with them because we have like a similar target group. Boom. Okay, well, send me an email. We did actually uh, contact them as well about potential partnership. As you know, we think that like if we advertise them and they provide us uh, bikes to give people for the subscription, they can really work together. Yeah, I'll send you the on that, and you can reply. Yeah, I, I'm also an office worker and, and cyclist, so I agree. I mean, some really good stuff here. Um, have you thought about your competition, or your competition might be, and oh, how do yeah. you differentiate yourself? Yeah, so essentially, we we um, sort of come down on competition. We noticed that struggle was a main competitor, and we really saw a problem with their app. Their app is so analytics, statistical based, that they just keep citing cyclists, but if I were to show it to one of you guys, put it on the site. So with our app, we're so centralized around the idea of community and friends. It's like you want to come to us, instead of us having to force you to come to us. Instead. So that's what differentiates us from Australia and other apps in the market. Um, I don't think that I can just say here, I think it's brilliant. It's very simple. Um, you can leverage against a lot of stuff that's already there, so you, you could probably start working with this right away. The idea that really grabbed me is that some, that having biking groups, so I think that that's really a, a differentiator because in like there's so, you know, you have so many disparate people who, for example, moved to London, you should think about you know how you can link people who are moving into um, London or or the UK and how that gives them another social group to become a part of. I love it. Um, we're not actually necessarily localized in London actually because we can pretty much uh, implement our services in any city location, so like Paris, Amsterdam. Yeah. Okay. I know you can do it by yourself. I know you started already. So if I can speak by hand, you can do the content. I know you can. You already started playing this often. But a lot of the teenagers um, that apply this year are unionists, so many of them have tried to do stuff that they've never done. 
Okay, so uh, last but not least, um, catch your idea, are you ready? Did you know that one in seven women will be diagnosed with breast cancer throughout their lifetime? This is such an alarming fact, and it's actually the most commonly diagnosed cancer in the UK at the moment. And we are early catch, and we are trying to save lives sooner. I'm Alessio, and I'm the CMO. I'm Aoife, and I'm the CEO. Hi, I'm Jade, I'm the CEO. Um, and we've come together to tackle this problem because we all know somebody who has full cancer and we really want to try and help other patients going through the same process as they did. The physical process of actually screening breast cancer is often very time consuming and can be very painful for the patients. We believe that everyone should get a diagnosis pain free, quick and efficient. The current process starts with an x ray. If the doctors are concerned, they'll do an FNA biopsy. This is with a thin needle and a small sample. It's not very accurate, so lots of doctors are unsure about the diagnosis. This is why they do a core or surgical biopsy. This can be very painful and costs more. <coughs> so, what is our solution? Well, we actually want to improve the FNA biopsy. We want to make it more accurate, and using AI, the doctors will be able to see what the best solution for the cancer is. And now we'll show you our demo. So this is our proof of concept. And the reason I say proof of concept is because we didn't actually have access to any FNA samples because of how high security they are. So instead we trained our neural network using core biopsies. So if I simply upload an image that this album has never seen before, we can see that this patient has an 81.9% cancer risk. Our unique selling point is that re by reducing the number of people who have to undergo intrusive and uncomfortable procedures, and we want people to know if they have cancer during their first biopsy. So what, how do we aim to reach out to people? So as you can see, we have created an Instagram account, and um, that's because we feel like social media is being used more and more every day, and it's very important that lots of people know about us. Furthermore, we have created a website so people can easily find us on the internet. We also feel like it's very important that we reach out to doctors in medical conferences as that's where most of our market will be. So, what do we aim to do next? Well, we actually need your help and we would really like to find a partnership with some labs. So, we would like to understand more knowledge and also support. Um, the important thing is that we also get the data sets for the FNA biopsies. This is really important as that means we can turn our proof of concept into an actual product so we can test it. We are early catch and we are saving lives soon. Thank you for listening. to consumers, because this one sounds like you go to the first part of testing, and that testing is normally handled through the NHS or through systems of doctors and testing labs. So it seems like they should be a target rather than trying to talk to us, unless we're in America where you kind of self-diagnose. So what's your thinking in trying to go there and spend money there when really you need to get to the labs? Um, so yeah, I forgot to say that, sorry. Um, 
we actually reached out to several people who are experts in this field and we currently got Jessica who is supposed to be one of the judges to be on our board of advisors. We are supposed to be partnering with them, we're not targeting consumers. So obviously, the intent is in my plan. I think there's a lot of people that have put a lot of uh, money already in there. So um, I guess my question is, how different are you from some of the people that I've just tried it before? Um, so yeah, there are a lot of competitors. Um, we a lot of people are looking into this because it is such a big issue. So people do mind as another competition for people in university as well. Um, but they're all looking at core biopsies. We don't want people to go through core biopsies because of how uncomfortable they are. They are also more expensive than FNA. Um, they're around 500 pounds, and then surgical biopsies are a few thousand. So if we can get FNAs to be accurate with the AI model, we would be saving money and preventing these patients from going down the early steps. Awesome. So I'm just uh, diving on, on some of the work that you guys went through. Um, and I mean, you guys just uh, trained the train model. Uh, what would you say was the um, most challenging part you had to overcome? And uh, you know, what would you say would be the, your next steps? I mean, I, I don't want to go into too much detail why you chose this architecture, but if you want to also talk about that, you want to, 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 to listen to that. Yeah, so originally I was speaking to one of the mentors, and we were going to make a CNN. But the issue with that is we only had our local machines. And speaking to the mentors, we decided we needed a lot of GPUs and servers to actually host the CNN and train our data. So then we decided to make a proof of concept using a pre-training Keras algorithm. And then if we were to advance it with mentorship and resources, we would implement a CNN and actually train the new biopsies instead of using the core biopsies that way. What, what would you say uh, was the most challenging part of, of um, putting this together? Yeah, so the most challenging part was coming in here, not knowing much about AI. So obviously I knew the concept, but the most I knew was unsupervised and supervised learning. So I've never actually coded any algorithms or used AI in Python before. So I would say that's probably the most challenging place. I mean, really, really big problem. So much so that indeed uh, my, my former team at DeepMind has been working on that, and indeed, there's a lot of people who really use that. Have you, how are you, as you know, there's two types of errors essentially. There's the cases you miss, and there are the cases where you give a false, uh, false positive, say to someone, well, actually, you're really at risk when they're not. Uh, how do you, or what's your plan to quantify the relative impact of these two and balance your fire according to the risk? Yeah, so first, obviously, we're going to need a lot, a lot of data. Especially working in the medical code, we want to make at least as mistakes as we can. So first, you train the model using a lot of data. And second, we don't want to replace doctors entirely. We still want some doctors there to give a backup to them if there are any issues screening with the FNA. So we still want some doctors there to kind of check over that. So that would kind of help cover any false positives or false negatives. And that's why we also have contacted and reached out to lots of experts because we only started this topic on Tuesday. <laughs> um, so we had to a lot. So just a very quick background. The team started with um, homelessness as a problem to tackle. Um, then they couldn't quite find the relevant data set for the problem definition. Um, and then I think on day five, they thought we will maybe look into cancers. And then on Tuesday, I think they thought hmm, maybe we'll look into instead of one cancer, which was originally what they wanted to look into, into breast cancer. But the breast cancer challenge was with them from day one. It was actually suggested to them by Chris Bacall from ICR, but none of the two wanted to touch it, although it was very low hanging fruit. And then this two said, okay, it's Tuesday, we don't have much time, and we're going to do this. So he, Jay actually did have much time to do this which was, I think, phenomenal what you've done in the space of the time and based on the fact that he has never ever done any new on that or so anything like that. So it was a nice to I spoke to him for about a day and then he offered advice through Skype. And one of the other Martin mentors, Martin, was here a lot and he helped me with 
Okay, and I was asked to ask about the logo. So. <laughs> okay, so as I'm sure you can see, our logo is an optical illusion. And uh, we actually chose this because every person can inter interpret it in a different way. And it's, it's like cancer, each cancer patient is different. And we feel it's really important that we all tackle, uh, we get the help. We aim to get rid of their cancer in the same way. I have another question, Alessio, because I remember when I interviewed you, when I asked you, um, you know, how are you going to change the world, what did you say, do you remember? Uh, I think I said poverty. Uh, but there was something else that you said. So I just want to, I, I just want to create a company and I just want to become an entrepreneur. And you didn't really um, have a problem, a specific problem you wanted to tackle. So, um, amazing, um, I've what you've done in the last 10 days, so I'm really, really impressed. Okay, so, I'm not throw any other questions, um, we'll let you go. Okay, so what is going to happen now then?
So in terms of the, the uh, more details, I would want to give uh, uh, just more encouraging notes specifically to each of the teams, uh, specifically to uh, hydroponics. Uh, I felt it was very, very cool that uh, you, know, you guys actually uh, managed to play with hardware um, and combine it with uh, software. So uh, I do encourage more of that experimentation because that is something that is really going to be growing in terms of impact and what you will be able to do uh, uh, you know, in the next years to come. Uh, from early catch, again, you know, emphasis on the impressive amount of uh, 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 work that was done to really take a skeleton model and convert it into a use case that you know, is, is currently, as Julian pointed out, uh, quite uh, 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 present in industry. So it's a problem that people are trying to tackle and really trying to hack something up was quite impressive. Uh, educate, uh, educator. Uh, I thought uh, diving into the code was probably the most uh, extensive one. Uh, really trying to put together and hack together a Vue.js uh, uh, UI was pretty impressive. I would say keep doing not only extending that, that sort of product, but do more of those, right? And try to host them, get some feedback uh, from people. Um, show, uh, I think, uh, again, trying to like, hack together a uh, interface uh, leveraging some of the APIs, you know, standing on the shoulder of giants, leveraging a lot of the cloud native uh, uh, um, uh, uh, engines, you know, keep trying to see more of that because that allows you to get up to speed faster. Byteson, uh, great use of, of wireframes, you know, I would encourage not to just offload extra work to the developers that may come later. Uh, uh, but instead, to take this as an opportunity to, you know, build it uh, in house in real peace. Um, again, a key issue uh, that I think has massive impact. You know, we see that in the news every single day. Uh, definitely, really great to see the integrated extension. And I, I would like to see you guys trying to push it and get some feedback. So, again, you know, all in all, very, very impressed with the amount of stuff that you managed to do. I did jump on the code. I didn't expect you guys to have, you know, 100% test coverage. Uh, you know, that's always nice. But, um, you know, I think with, with that said, uh, uh, you know, I'll probably cover too much of the tech, but uh, uh, main thing is I want to encourage you to keep doing more of this. And, you know, Adele is already uh, uh, hosting several on the roadmap, so sign up. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's me. Quite a tour of systems by Alex Hanko. I'm going to be somewhat less deep. But indeed, uh, I really, there's a feeling that struck me first. This could have been some, and it sometimes puts to shame, some of the demo plays from some of the best incubators. Uh, I've seen you pitching with as much faith and confidence that startups that have been handed to go into a San Francisco incubator by people who've been at it for about well, twice your age. Uh, so, really, really cool. Um, really good. I also like that not all of your solutions jumped on AI. Yes, this is called Tiffin AI, and coming here you've learned about AI, but one of the great ways to solve problems with AI is also to know when not to use AI. There is so much hype around AI, and there are so much stories of problems which we're trying to use AI just because, or any tech du jour, and you have not made these mistakes. Throughout the different pitches, when AI was put forward, it was with a clear goal in mind, and when pressed on, okay, what's the backup plan, actually the, the, the almost ready answer, well, a bunch of it then, is like, it is the best possible solution you can answer, because you know that you can fall back onto rules, onto design rules that are interpretable, designed by a human, and can be proven safe. And that's really important to know that. So I'm really, you know, really, really impressed by that. Um, in, the, in the indicator, uh, okay, maybe it's not a dotty two-year-old and father of a two-year-old in me, uh, but in terms of design, thinking, hey, you know what, what's our user like? Yeah, he loves teddy bears. We're gonna be teddy bear into the loop. That is awesome, you know, really having a book. So, Educator really, uh, really struck me there. And the programming, you know, how do you put a word together? Well, these arrows and these motions, this is the beginning, the beginning of teaching them algorithms. This is really cool. Uh, 
Um, um, uh, you could look at, especially since you talked about the improvement, the sequential improvement of the learning process. Carnegie Mellon University released an open assignment toolkit, which is all about using different kinds of content techniques to refine the way we teach. Uh, I encourage you to have a look in there. That could be something you'd add to your to your app. Um, Green Feast really liked how you use simple Chrome extension to directly go where people are shopping. You know, a few years ago, if you wanted to be where people are shopping, you would have to go into a retailer, make big marketing, put big money to be in the head of the, of the aisle. And here, web extension, boom, you're directly between the user, the shopper, and his basket. This is such a good insertion point right there. Uh, and if you then later make deals with retailers to directly be embedded in their website, even better. But here, you directly insert that format, really great. Uh, I'd be curious to see how you can generalize that to mobile shopping. I do not know how many people shop from their phone, uh, but I know Chrome extensions are a little bit trickier to get there, uh, so something to, to dig into. Um, hydroponics, well, Chris commented already that you saw a copy then. Um, I just think, realizing like, there's a company that's doing RL for uh, greenhouses, not hydroponics, but buying greenhouses. Uh, something that for a few people in Malaysia, I'd be happy to introduce you to uh, for, for, for the chat. Um, show, I mean, for having a, a, a been a heavily bullied and ended up in the hospital uh, and my house tag and had some fire when I was a kid, uh, I really appreciate the focus that you are putting onto this work. It's, uh, well, obviously, deeply resonates uh, in me, and I think it's a problem that's definitely worth uh, addressing. Um, I'm not sure whether chatbots are the solution, but I'm sure that with the insights you have, and the answer you get about, oh, how do we put the parents in the loop? You know, the answer I heard here is the answers from teens who know what it means to have the parents in the loop. You know, as an adult, I'll be hearing, well, we need to put the principal caretaker into the loop, and they're the ones in charge of this kid. But I heard you say, well, you know, the parent is also that authority figure to which we do not necessarily want to relate. So bringing this kind of insight to the table, I think, is, is absolutely key. And that has nothing to do with AI. That has to do definitely with emotional intelligence, which you are showing in space. Uh, for Vicozone, it's, it's funny, the partnership with Santander, or with you know, Santander Vice, there's a brilliant success story of a startup from the first cohort of Entrepreneur First, a really well-known incubator that is now all around the world. The startup from this first cohort their first big partnership was the same enterprise. They made the green light, green laser light at the front of the city bikes. That's the startup. So looking to partner with such institutions uh, is, a, is a real great step forward because it also gives you the visibility to the customer and the way to put your tech straight into the hands of the distribution there. Uh, and early catch on, on breast cancer screening. I mean, there is uh, such a thriving research uh, efforts going there. Uh, there is the, the use of health, the use of machine learning for healthcare is one of the biggest markets at the moment. There are some massive players going in there. Um, Deepmind Health has been acquired, well, acquired merged into Google Health, um, and uh, I think going in there and wanting to push your, your skills to focus on the suffering of, uh, of people. And what I heard there is again. Well, yeah, there are companies that are doing that, but they're doing this on, on a painful biopsies. And you directly step into the shoes of the people who are getting these biopsies, and you're like, okay, hey, that is quite painful. This is not the experience I want to have. Uh, again, real great empathy. So for me, beyond the technical skills in your tech, and that's my day job, I love it. It's fun. I find it really cool. But if you just think about it, we're missing on 90% uh, of the world, and that's what I'm seeing here. So. Really congratulations to everyone for that. Thank you for that. I think there's much that to be said. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So I'll be much shorter. So I think I'll, um, well, obviously, kind of looking at the, uh, what my predecessor have mentioned, I'll focus on the social impact and the innovation. Uh, this innovation is kind of my space. Um, we're trying to always come up, um, you know, uh, 
in new ways of solving an existing problem, uh, new ways that those new technologies are kind of doing with us. And I think there you have been very creative. The ideas you have uh, are very crisp. You know which problem you're going to solve. Uh, you understand the end user, uh, and you actually come up with a, a very clear picture of how you're going to solve that problem. And I think that's that's actually a major thing. I mean, the design thinking, the human center, really making sure you're framing the problem in the right way is something that all the teams have done, you know, exceptionally well. Um, and I think a big kudos uh, for that. Yeah. Um, must be adrenaline filled at the end of the day after 10 days of 12 days knocking this out. So congratulations to you all. A um, couple of things I think that I picked up today, I mean apart from all the other stuff you guys have covered brilliantly, is um, uh, think when you're, when you're putting it together um, about scale, not about price, not about revenue. Because if you can get something that scales, you will eventually work out to make money off it. But if you don't scale it, it doesn't matter how much you charge, you just won't make it. Yeah, so scale is a, is a critical one there. Um, I think that the other one that I thought you did is brilliantly, and, and you're right, the pitching level was phenomenal. Um, so well done. If you've never done it before, and that's your first time, take a pat on the back. What I would encourage you to do is when you leave here today, it's generally easy to go away and then by Monday not be thinking about ever being in touch with the team. Firstly, stay in touch with the teams. What's really important about that is, um, Elena's got a list which basically means that you're going to be meeting up with the team in the future. Going place and presenting. I would ask you not to put it in the drawer and forget about it, but improve and refine your pitch. So that by the time you've gone two or three down the line, by the time I see you probably in MasterCard in October, I want you guys kind of knock it out of the park and frightening everybody in my business. Because you can do it, you're so close, but a little bit more practice, you will be brilliant. And that will stand you instead no matter what job you do in the future. So keep it up and well done. Honestly, uh, I've seen a lot of pictures, and, and this one is quite complete. You covered the target statement, you covered the pain points, you touched on the go to market, you, you touched on the technology, uh, uh, and you basically in the light uh, how some, some of the aspects are not or neglected. I would just recommend that when you it's about the people, and when you, when you do present an idea, talk about what could go wrong proactively before someone actually triggers the topic for you. Uh, talk about um, the challenges. Uh, talk about, cover the homework that you've done and the extensive research that you've done and the effort that you've put into it so that you show your level of pragmatism and, and diligence. Uh, it's better to actually proactively put it on the table than have someone do it for you. Uh, so I think when you do um, enhance your pitch, think about the work could go wrong, otherwise people won't do it for you. And then you're there. Sorry? And then you're there. <laughs> <laughs> I think you guys were sensational, just so impressive, and I've, I've asked the question a couple of times, how many days did they have to do all that? So absolutely, first class. Um, Two things. One, make data your friend. So, you know, just thinking about some of the um, ideas that we heard today, go back, get the feedback. The bullying show, keep talking to young people. Try to blast that out on social media so that you will really start to get your data set. What are the issues? What would be helpful to you? Have you been bullied? You know, make sure that you're research is as sound as possible because it will also help you to inform how you develop your product. All of you, don't be afraid to think about going international. We are talking about the, um, the Viking app. Um, in addition to thinking about, you probably have three apps in that one app, right, that you can think about as discrete audiences. Secondly, think about places where people need to have bites. 
right? So, for example, in Singapore, a car costs about hundred thousand dollars because the government doesn't want people driving. So they almost have a captured market in a very safe environment. So, you know, as I said at the beginning, just think about scale. Think about going big. And thirdly, don't be afraid to get adults to help you. I would say that, that the pitching you did today was first class. You start going on LinkedIn and linking in with the people who you think can help you and directly ask for their support. Start networking with people who have had some of these ideas. They won't see you as the competition, but meanwhile, you can start to aggregate their thinking, what they've already thought about, the mistakes they've already made into your, into your uh, products. Amazing, thank you. I think that the, the one piece of advice I always said is exactly as, as, as you read, which is use the grown ups, um, use them for all they've got. Yeah. Even as, as when I heard first pitch uh, educators saying that they need now to see everyone's story, I was like, that's what I want to see. <laughs> and be brave, be uh, continue uh, using your youth against all of us because uh, we want to help now. And, uh, I think it will be really fun to see what you can uh, what you can get done. So uh, keep asking us and everybody else you think about. Okay. Yeah, and I can't be to anything that, that has been said here. It's been um, fantastic feedback. And I, I think uh, I'll just go on a different tack and say, you know, it, it's such an incredible opportunity, I think, to be exposed simultaneously to the worlds of AI and startups at your age. I mean, there are very few people in the entire world, I would say, doing what you're doing right here, right now, at, at your age as teens. Um, really pretty <laughs> opportunity, I would say. Um, you know, it's very easy to, to go back and let life take over. Um, but, but stay in touch, keep in touch with the team, and just realize that this is a really, really unique opportunity um, that the research is going very, very well. So, so just appreciate that and, and run with it. Very good advice there. So I hope teams were making notes. I didn't really notice anyone making notes. Well, mental notes after ten days of like twenty four seven work. Um, okay, but we're recording this, so hopefully all this will be available to you to do what you really want. Uh, but yes, we would love you to stay in touch with your teams because there is a lot of interesting stuff that uh, will be happening if you stay in touch and if you carry on uh, working on your products. So um, it was very, very difficult for the judges to decide who's going to get what. Like I said, I sent an email and I got lots of wonderful suggestions and, and offerings. So I'm going to start with Team Educator in the same order. Try, I'll try to, to go in the same order. So um, Educator has been offered to, um, to go to Accenture. Uh, to present in front of your clients or to do a presentation, and you will get a deep of shows. Uh, one I just uh, mentioned that you should definitely get in touch with Techstars and uh, Max Kelly. Um, I have a contact I can connect to you, uh, and uh, because Max sometimes runs um, Techstars Amazon Alexa, so uh, you could definitely participate or, um, or definitely enter that competition or whatnot. But do keep, keep an eye on what Amazon and um, searching out there because it is voice that it could be. Um, uh, clear. So um, next, Greenfist. So Greenfist has been offered uh, to go to IX Studio uh, with IBM. Uh, and and Sabine mentioned that uh, IBM is a food trust blockchain. Uh, and she would be very happy to introduce you and see how you can uh, grow Greenfist. Uh, so that one is for you. And Greenfist have also been offered to go um, with um, Mastercard or Peach to Mastercard. Um, and. Uh, you have been offered a connection um, to Providence. Uh, which one of you is going to make that connection happen? Yeah, Harry. Oh, yeah. He's going to make that connection. Um, he will definitely be hosted by Mastercard and IX Studio with IBM. So well done, Green Feast, as well. Uh, can I have some class? <laughs> So, um, show. So, team show, you will be going to Quarter Black. I know one of the team members has already been to Quarter Black. Um, so, they will definitely be able to help you um, further with your algorithm. And I know the team has also been invited uh, to Constellation AI, so we'll continue the conversation 
with Jihan because he was very, very keen that he could to help um, on the technology side. Um, but then uh, John uh, will be introducing that to Fact Marta. Yes. <laughs> and uh, Harry will introduce him to his safety net for some further conversations. And that means those team are developing something similar, which helps me in some other ways. All right. Uh, Bike our zone, coming to you. So, uh, intro to TFL. So, it would be very uh, good for you to, to speak to TFL. Um, Beryl, we definitely have to have an opportunity to speak to Beryl. Um, and Pradina. Pradina, uh, in Harry as well. Yeah, technician. You or John. Uh, you or John. Okay, perfect. Uh, with early catch, um, you guys will definitely be going to Quantum Black because Quantum Black is doing some really interesting stuff on cancer as well. Um, and John will introduce you to Cancer UK. All right. Uh, we will still have conversations with Jessica and we'll still have conversations with Chris so that you can potentially get an internship or work experience with either. Um, everybody will. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, everybody will definitely be going to COGEX and so making time for all of this. So, COGEX uh, costs over 2,000 pounds to attend. So, each one of the team members or all the teams will be able to go there for free. And that usually happens here at Love Attack Week in June. So make sure you stay in touch with your teams until then. Um, and uh, all teams have also been offered to go on a tour uh, of McKinsey. So they've just uh, moved into a different um, place. Uh, and, and you will be all going on a tour uh, to McKinsey, tour and lunch, yeah. Perfect. And the team that got a lot of attention this time was Hydroponics. Uh, so you guys will be going to be Accenture uh, and you will get your eco shows as well. Uh, you have also been invited to, uh, to go to MasterCard uh, to pitch your idea there. Um, McKinsey is hosting, a, is organizing a conference in November, an AI conference, and you will be invited to present in that conference. And lastly, um, Element AI has offered, uh, have offered to help you write a submission paper to um, to the conference, to a conference, it's usually they are NURIS, uh, ICML, or something like that. And because you already have Peter on your team, uh, he will help with that submission and contribution. So, and um, that, I'm afraid, concludes the prizes. Uh, we will definitely carry on speaking to Jessica as well, because I know she's been watching this, because she offered, um, she invited you to go to, to come to Oxfix Lab. Um, as well. So we probably will try and arrange this sometime in October during half term. Um, and I'm hoping it will be convenient for all, but we'll probably suggest a few days and we'll go out to Oxford and see the ethics there. Hopefully, but we will um, confirm that. We'll speak to Jessica first because she's not here. Um, right. Well done, everyone. All the support you have um, offered to us and Accenture, I mean, without the three days that we spent with you, none of the design thinking would have happened and the innovation, everything that gets um, put into their minds from the, from the very beginning. I know Adam was here, but we wanted to thank your team um, for doing all the work, please do. Um, and obviously, all the other judges and uh, all the partners, thank you very much. I know uh, Harry will have a special partnership with Tech Nation, uh, with Applied AI Corporate, and hopefully, we will. Um, have more stuff offered or more partnerships um, uh, with, with the group technician and all the other stuff, startups. So I have got my daughter who I have to congratulate you because she's had last day she's just turned 17 today. So I'm going to ask you to sing a song, but I would love to just thank you all for being with us for the last 10 days. I hope you, the young people, have learned a lot, and so uh, I will definitely ask you to write a blog post about your experience because we want um, uh, all everyone else in the world to learn about this experience. Uh, we will be sending you digital certificates and any other event until you know, next August. You can come to all the events uh, for price or free if you're from uh, you know um, underrepresented by grants. We will always say. You know, we are each with our special mission. So if you're um, participating for free, we'll be participating for free in all our programs. Um, yes? Did I forget to mention some squad points? Uh, and one person who hasn't got any thanks so much has been working like crazy to put that together, not only this week, but throughout many iterations, is Elena. So I think uh, yeah. people are very much.
challenges you the most. So hydroponics really did challenge you, you told me. Uh, which is why you guys are very lucky, so you will stay with me for a long time. <laughs> but everyone else, you will be invited to our WhatsApp group and you will meet others who have been in our programs before. So, Alessia, you have a question? We used to say thank you to the cameraman. <laughs> yeah. um, any comments, questions, anything? Anything else anyone wants to say? Before we close and say goodbye to you, before we get kicked out of here by the amazing reactive team. Go, <laughs> yeah, those comments? All right, so you're free to go. Thank you very much. <laughs>